Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Oh, I love it. This is the best time to be in Chicago land. It's going to be 80 degrees. The leaves are coming out. Kids are home from college. Where else would you rather be than in Hinsdale, Illinois today? So if you're joining us online, we're so sorry that you're not with us live because this is going to be a special, special Sabbath. Today, we have Mother's Day celebration, and so all our moms, we're going to treat you with something in a few minutes. We're going to have a baby dedication. We're going to have a baptism. Trifecta today. Praise God. So I'm looking forward to this Sabbath day. I know that you're going to be blessed. So there's three things we want you to know today. Today, this afternoon, our Pathfinders have an investiture program. It's going to be here at the church from 2 to 3 p.m. Come and support our young people, our Pathfinder Club. There'll be a reception afterward. Number two, I want to just, we want to celebrate with our Pathfinder team, our Bible Bowl experience team last week was down in Portland, Oregon for the North American Division um, level. I guess this would be a national championship. We've never gone this far. Our team was down there. We're so proud of them. They play second at the Nationals, which is a great feat. And I just want to read the names of this team. If you're here today, you guys, um, please stand. This is Nathan Tessely. Um, Nathan Tessely, I believe this is also Nathan. Nathan Nelson, that's it. Jade, Mark, Jade, Marcus, Dean, Ian, and Therese. Are you guys here at all today? Therese, awesome. We're so proud of you guys. Thank you guys. Give them a hand, please. And then our young people, it's summertime. The weather's getting warmer. We're going to start doing our Friday night fellowships with you guys again. So Pastor Rodney and the youth team, this Friday, May 13th, we're starting this back up. We're going to meet here at the church at 5.30 p.m. We're going to have some games and some activities and obviously food. And then you're going to have a little worship time, okay? So 5.30 Friday nights, fireside Friday vespers. I love this time of year. I love it because my kids are home, so that's a big thing. And we, we enjoy all our college kids being home. And so when you see them, I want you to hug them, tell them their church misses them, and that we're glad that they're here. It's nice for them to know that they are missed, okay? So do that for me. We have some seniors graduating in the next couple of weeks. We're going to say a prayer for them maybe in a couple weeks, but we're glad you're here this Sabbath. As we continue our celebration, I'm going to invite all our kids to come up front for our children's story. And as they come down, we want you to hold up those dollar bills, those $20 bills. Come here to Dr. Rivas. He's got a bigger bill than that. And um, come down for your children's story. And we got a special, special children's story today by the oldest one yet in the building, Brent Tolentino. So awesome. Thank you, buddy.
Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. I can't hear you. All right, I want you to raise your hand if this sounds like your mom or grandma. Clean up your room. If she ever asked before you leave anywhere, did you go to the bathroom before you leave? Or if you didn't finish your homework that day, did you finish your homework? How about eat your vegetables? Or if you ask them for something and they tell you to go ask your dad instead. All right. Okay, how about a few more? Um, when your mom or grandma hugs you too tight? Or when they kiss you too much? <laughs> or they tell you they love you? Um, your mom and or grandma loves you very much and probably tells you that every day. When I was younger, and actually till this day, I'm, I get into a lot of accidents. And sometimes it gets scary when you go to the hospital and uh, the doctors are doing a lot of stuff. But someone that's always, that, was, that was always next to me was my mom. And she kept me through those hard times uh, when it was, I was in really dark places. And I thank her a lot for all I am today. Did you know that the love your mom and our grandma has for you shows how much God loves you? Or repeat after me. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. Isaiah 66, verse 13. God is saying that when our grand mom or our grandma comforts us, it is the same comfort God will give us. God loves you just as much as your mom does. Let's honor our mom and grandmas for showing their love and, their, and for showing how much our God loves us. Um, would you like to pray, Brayden? Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. I hope we can all celebrate our mothers and grandmas and our dads, uncles, grandpas, and other people. And I hope we can all be as happy as a community. And I hope we can all celebrate and be joyful for what our moms and dads have done for us to keep us alive and stay. And stay. So Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Okay, kids, you stay here. Now we have something special for all the mommies in the church. So I want all the mommies of Hinzo Finlam to stand up. Go ahead, stand up. We want to celebrate you guys because your love sh shows the love of Jesus to all these kids. So let's give a hand to all these moms. All right, amen, amen. So, here's your job. Look to your left. Do you see those beautiful red roses? Look to your left. Who are they for? Your moms. So, grab one rose and go ahead and give it to your moms. We want to celebrate our moms for Mother's Day. And all those who are kids or maybe a little, are not kids anymore, the Pathfinders are going to come and give roses to you as well. So when you get the roses, go ahead and sit down. One rose. One rose per child. And you know, as you give your, flower, your rose, why don't you give a big hug to your mommy? Or maybe a kiss.
grab a rose for your mom as well. All right, amen and amen. So I'm going to ask the mothers to stand up one more time. I'm going to pray a special prayer for you. You guys are the backbone of the family. Your love, your constant kisses, your hugs show the love of Jesus to the rest of us. So I'm going to pray a special prayer onto you for this beautiful Mother's Day weekend. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our mothers. Lord, we are so thankful for the moms because their love, their kisses, their hugs, their constant devotion to the family and to the kids represent the love that you have for each and every one of us. So I pray, Father, Lord, that you may continue to bless them. All their efforts are not in vain, Lord. We see it. We see them when they wash the dishes. We see it when they clean. We see it when they look after our kids. And we just want to pray a special prayer unto them that you may continue to let them know that they are well-loved by their family and most importantly by you. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. As the mothers are sitting down, we are going to go off and receive the offering today. And just like what uh, Elder Jason has said, this is a special Sabbath. A lot of things are going on. We want to celebrate a lot of things. So as the offerings are going to be received in this moment, guess what? We are going to have a baby dedication. So baby dedication will be coming up right now as the offering is being collected at this moment. Happy Sabbath, church family. What a, what a joyous and exciting Sabbath we get to have today. As was mentioned, it's one of great excitement, one of great joy for us as a church community uh, that on this day we get to be able to dedicate a very special family, specifically baby Emily, on this, this great day. The Sorianos are a special family, amen? And, and it's such a blessing to have them in this church, in this congregation. For me personally, to be able to share in this moment with them is very meaningful. Uh, with, with Pastor Nestor, we've shared many exciting moments in life together from times in high school and college and roommates and now being able to minister in the same state together. We're excited to be with them. For the Sorianos, they've been so meaningful to my life as I met them, as I see Mom Lilia and and nestling and meeting the rest of the family, met them in, in the fall of 1998, imagine that. And their home was a gathering place uh, where we would always come together at all hours of the day. All hours of the day we would be there together and, and spending time there. And so it is very meaningful to be able to share in this moment together. And as we, we talk about dedication, as we talk about this moment where we get to, as a family, church community, set Emily apart. It's a special moment in which we know has great biblical meaning and history. We remember the story of the Old Testament, right, as Hannah received a blessing from the Lord and she said she wanted to commit that child to the Lord every day of his life. We think of the New Testament even in the times of Jesus where Mary and Joseph took baby Jesus to the temple and how he was dedicated. And so this special moment in setting apart that is very meaningful for the Sorianos, uh, a moment in which they want to be able to set baby Emily apart, and a moment that is joyous for the Lord. I want to just read to you two passages very briefly. One, written in Desire of Ages, speaking about the ministry of Jesus as he worked with children. It says that Jesus Christ, he would watch the children as they played, oftentimes expressing his approval when they, were, when they would win an innocent victory over something that he had set them out to do. He would sing to them, sing to the children with sweet and blessed words. And he knew, they knew that he loved them. 
He never unfairly scolded them. He shared with them in those childhood joys and sorrows. And he would often gather some flowers, the same flowers which he had created, and he would gift them to them. He would leave them with this special gift, the ones that he had created for them, and he would take delight in seeing their joy as they experience life. And so children are so special to the heart of Jesus, and I know they're very special to this church community as well. And so baby Emily, she came into the Soriano family on March of 2020. March, day to be exact, March 4, March 4 at 9.59 a.m. She blessed the Soriano home, joined them with their older sister, Eliana, and has been a continued blessing for them ever since. She loves to sing, right? You love to sing with the family? Oh, she said, yeah, you see that? And her favorite song is, Jesus loves me, this I know. You love that song? And because they're a musical family, you can imagine, she sings on key. And... Uh, <laughs> And she enjoys to be able to spend time with them. And so Emily, Madison, Soriano, I am so excited to share in this special moment with you that together as a family, we get to thank God for your life. We get to thank God for blessing your mom and your dad and your sister. And as a church community, we want to be able to commit continually to their support. Pastoral families, you know, they do so much in serving so many people within our church walls, outside of our church walls, and, and we're thankful for all that they do. And as a church community, we want to continually support them. There's a passage in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, which you know, and I want to just read it together for us as a reminder of not only their commitment as a family, but I, I believe it also speaks to what we do together as a church community. And it says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall walk and talk with them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you shall, they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. As, this, as the Soriano family commits to, to helping their children and Emily grow in a knowledge of Jesus Christ, I believe that's also an appeal for all of us as a church community to continue to love and support and educate and to nurture them in the ways of the Lord. So as they walk through the hallways, as they're running through the pews, and as they're coming together in various events and moments, we as a church community can embrace them, can love them, can support them, can cherish them, and be with them as we journey alongside with Jesus. Amen? And so in that same, in light of that, we'd like to be able to invite our church elders to be able to come to the front and, and our, your elders represent uh, the church at large. And we want to invite our elders to come forward and surround the family as a symbol of your consistent guidance and support and love shown to them. We're thankful for these moments together. So we'll see if baby Emily will let me hold her for a little bit. Oh, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. She wants to be with Papa. I'll come close, I'll come close. I don't want to block Catherine. I want to be right behind you over here. And so we can all lay hands on the family, the extended family here as well, and invite the congregation that we would all reach out as a symbol of our love and support and our appreciation for them and how we'll continually pray for their guidance. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we are so thankful, so thankful for your love and your mercy. We are thankful for these moments that as a church family we get to share together. Father, we're thankful for Emily. Thank you for blessing the Sorianos with her life, with her joy, with her laughter, with her presence, and in all the moments that they share together day to day. Father God, we pray that there would be moments are recorded not only in their hearts and in their minds, but into eternity. And Father God, we pray that as they, uh, Nestor and Catherine, uh, Father, understand the great responsibility that they have to help their children uh, learn more about you, understanding and, and engraving the image of the loving Savior in their hearts and their minds. We pray that you would strengthen them, that you would give them wisdom, that you would give them discernment, that you would lift them up in moments of great challenge, 
that, Father God, you would remind them of your love and that they are not alone in raising these children that you have given to them. And so, Father God, we pray that you would continually uphold them. Father, as a church community, we, we commit this morning to walk alongside of them. We commit to being there for them. We commit to, to raising them up and helping them uh, as we understand that it takes a village to raise children and that we all play a part in the edification of the children and the families that make part of this church community. And so, Father, as, as a church family, we ask that you would continually give us grace and wisdom and patience and, uh, to serve uh, Eliana, Emily, to serve all the children of this church. And then, Father God, we would be even more excited to, to see our children fall in love with you and know you and commit to living for you. And so, Father God, in a very special way, we dedicate Emily and we ask that your Holy Spirit, as what's poured out into the lives of so many children and as they came to know you, that, that she would continue to know you and that her life would be a reflection of, of that relationship. Thank you, Father God, for this moment. We ask in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. And happy Mother's Day to all the moms and the grandmothers out here. Isn't it a beautiful day outside? Who's thankful for the sunny um, Sabbath today? And God is good. So if you believe that, let's all stand and sing our first song.
sudden I am unaware of this affliction It's eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me And oh, how he loves us It's all possible, please kneel with me as we pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this holy Sabbath day. Thank you, Lord, for the break in the rain, for all the many blessings you've given to us. And just like the rain, Lord, our days may be dark, it may be stormy. We don't remember the last time we've seen the sun. We don't remember the last time we felt warmth. But throughout it, Lord, we thank you for blessing us, for giving us the rain in our lives, constantly blessing us, even though things may be stormy. So, Father, please watch over those today that have storms in their lives, who are dealing with physical ailments, who are struggling with mental conditions who are trying to figure out financial burdens, Lord, please watch over them. Please watch over your members. Anybody that wants to come to you today, Lord, please accept them. 
So Lord, please be with your local church. Watch over us, Lord, as we make plans for the future and continue on during these times. Father, please help us to remember that you are the foundation of our church. Help us to remember that whatever we do, Lord, wherever we go, however we move forward as a church, that you will always be our center, that you will always be our God, so that whatever we may do, that people will see that, that people will know that you are our God. And by extension, Lord, please watch over the world church. Those members, those who follow you, who are far away, and we can't even comprehend what they may be going through right now, what kind of storms may be brewing in their lives and that they have to deal with. Lord, we, it's easy to get complacent and comfortable here, but we can't forget that everybody is precious to you, that we are all precious to you, Lord. So please watch over us. We know that you have the power to be able to move us, to direct us. So Lord, please help us to remember that, that you are our God, and that we are your people. Please forgive us, Lord, for all our sins we've committed and watch over us as we go throughout the rest of the Sabbath day. No, Lord, please watch over Nestor as he preaches to us and breaks the word of life. Please help us to gain something of it, a blessing that we can take with us wherever we go. In your name I pray. Amen. Sabbath. It is good to see everyone here. Thank you, praise team, for the beautiful praise team. I really like, I'm digging the sitting on stools uh, format. Beautiful. And thank you, Don, for, for praying for us. Today's a special day. Today is a special day. Uh, and I do want to say this. I have missed you, church family. I've been gone for three weeks. Two weeks ago, I was getting ready to preach in Galatians chapter 4 or chapter 3 and 4, and then my wife got sick, and then Eliana got sick, and then Emily got sick, and I decided on Thursday that I probably shouldn't go in case I get someone else sick. So I stayed, Uncle Bing, Elder Bing Alabada preached, and he did an excellent job, probably better than I would do, and I was so blessed by that message. Last Sabbath, I was away in Wisconsin, speaking at Wisconsin Academy, uh, and Pierre, Elder Pierre, preached a very powerful, practical message that I really enjoyed as I listened to it. And today I'm here to share with you about the book of Galatians, about the gospel, about the freedom that we can have in Jesus. Do you believe that we can be free in Jesus, that we can experience freedom in the gospel? When I think of the gospel, I think about you mothers. I would be remiss not to recognize at least a few mothers here. I have a good friend who flew here from Colorado. She was our secretary at Campion Church for six years, my friend Teresa, and she's here, a mother. I would be remiss to not remember my sister who's also here, an amazing mother. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize uh, my special wife who is a mother of two, hardworking, sacrificial mother. And I would also be remiss to, to not to neglect recognizing my own mother, who you have been praying for. As you know, I came here in the month of August. My mom had a stroke. She's alive today. She's here for the first time after she has been out of the the hospital and rehab. And so thank you, mothers, my mom, for your sacrifice. And for all the mothers here, I have a special poem, poem from you. I wish I wrote it. I didn't. But this was from Helen Steiner Rice. A mother's love is something that no one can explain. It is made of deep devotion and of sacrifice and pain. It is endless and unselfish and enduring, come what may, for nothing can destroy it or take that love away. 
It is patient and forgiving when all others are forsaking, and it never fails or falters even though the heart is breaking. It believes beyond believing when the world around condemns, and it glows with all the beauty of the rarest, brightest gems. It is far beyond defining. It defies all explanation, and it still remains a secret like the mysteries of creation. A many-splendored miracle man cannot understand, and another wondrous evidence of God's tender guiding hand. Mothers, Thank you for being evidence of God's tender guiding hand. Let's pray. Father, what a special day this is. Yes, we had a baby dedication. We're going to experience a beautiful baptism at the end of this message. But I want to recognize our mothers here. I know firsthand what it's like, well, secondhand, as I see my wife care for our children. I saw my mom care for me. And I know this, I, I can begin to under, uh, imagine the, the sacrifice that our mothers make. So thank you, Lord, for our moms today. We recognize them. We glorify you for them. And thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us with mothers who give us a picture of your character. As we open your word and dive in and learn about your freedom and love, bless us. Give us an understanding of your nature. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's give a round of applause for our month. Can we do that? <laughs> we got to. So moms, your example is a picture of who Jesus is. It's a picture of who Jesus is. This message was, I was so blessed studying this message. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. We've been on this really three-month journey of covering the entire book of Galatians. Now we're studying the first half of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. You're welcome to turn there. There are some ideas in here that made me want to do uh, backflips. There are concepts and idea, ideas in here that I have never seen before. And because I have been studying the gospel and studying about Christ's character, uh, God gave me some, under, some uh, flashes and, and a picture of his character that, that made me want to do backflips. And so I'm going to try to contain my excitement because I can get pretty enthusiastic and, and excited, excited. And just let me know if it's a little bit too much for you all, okay? But I'm just super excited about Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to discover what does it mean to be free, okay? What, what is the gospel and, and how does the gospel give us freedom? A question we're going to answer is this. If the gospel makes me free or sets me free, am I free to do whatever I want then? That's what we're going to try to address today. What does gospel freedom look like? And does being free mean that I can do whatever I want? So I, I hope you brought your thinking caps. Do you have your thinking caps? Let's put it on together. We're going to dive deep. And then we are going to be blessed by a beautiful baptism. So here we go. I'm going to give it to you. Give two realities, two realities of gospel freedom. Two realities of what? Gospel freedom. Here's number one. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Don't fail on me, blackboard. We are free. What word is that? Can you read my handwriting? Free from the... Okay, so I'm going to underline this in case you forget. In case you forget. All right? We are, number, reality number one, okay, two realities of gospel freedom. Number one, we are free from the law. All right, Nestor, what are you talking about? Let's go to the Bible. Let's start with verse 2. Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 2. Here we go. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you, speaking to the Galatians, the new Galatian believers, I say to you, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. What is he talking about here? If you're circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing? You know the story. Paul's talking to the Galatian believers. This group of opposers called the Judaizers are trying to trick these new believers, saying, look, in order for you to be accepted by God, you have to be circumcised, and you have to keep the law perfectly. That's how you can have a right standing with God. And Paul comes on the scene and says, hey, 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 hit the pause button right there. Look, if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing, Galatian believers, so don't listen to those opposers. And then notice what he says in verse 3. 
And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. So Galatian believers, you're listening to these, these opposers who are saying, in order for you to be saved, you have to get circumcised. And if you're circumcised, that begins your journey of keeping the law perfectly as a, way to, as a means by which you are saved. So, yeah, okay, Galatian believers, if you choose to be circumcised, then you've got to keep the whole law perfectly, to the T, scrupulous, exact, accurate. Yes, commandment number one. Yes, two, three, four, five. I kept all ten commandments. And you have to constantly watch yourself. Look what he says in verse 4. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Paul, what is Paul saying to the, new, the, the believers here? He's saying, look, you are divorced from Christ. Those of you who are trying to be justified by the law. That's a theological term for those of you who are trying to be saved or trying to be accepted by God by your obedience. And he, said, he says that those of, those of you who have fallen for this lie, you have fallen from grace. You have fallen from grace, believers. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. And then he says this in verse 1. Look. He says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What's he saying here? This idea that, that your circumcision and your perfect law-keeping will save you, that's called bondage. A uh, modern term for that is slavery. This kind of thinking is slavery. Paul's saying we are free from the law as a means by which we are accepted by God. That's what he means. Galatian believers, Christian church today in 2022, we are free from the law as a means by which we are saved, as a means by which we are accepted by God. Look at verses 7 and 8. You're still thinking, like, what is Netzer saying here? Look at verses 7 and 8. He says this. You ran well, Galatian believers. 7. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Who hindered you, Galatian believers? Christian believers? Verse 8. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. Did you hear what he said? This persuasion, this idea from the Judaizers, the opposers, who said that, who are saying that you have to be circumcised and keep the law perfectly as a means by which you are saved, these people, they're way off the wall. They're, they're way off. He says that that persuasion does not come from God. It doesn't come from God. Look at this in verse 9. I love this illustration. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I was like, what is leaven? So I looked up leaven, and leaven, as you know, is a substance. It's typically yeast. What does yeast do when you put it into dough? It causes bread to rise. So I actually wanted to see the process. So I went on YouTube. Uh, it was a three-and-a-half-minute clip, and I put it at one and, a half, one and a half speed because I couldn't stand how she was talking so slowly. I just wanted to see the, the bread rise. So she put the yeast in, and because the yeast one was in there and she let the bread sit, what happened? The dough rised. What's Paul saying? Galatian believers, check this out. Christians, a little merit mindset, a little perfectionism makes a lot of a large perfectionism. A little merit mindset, what is, Pastor, what do, you, what do you mean by merit mindset? This idea that somehow my circumcision and my works, my perfect obedience is somehow going to merit the favor of God to save me, a little merit mindset creates a large merit mindset. And that is dangerous. I mean, Paul uses strong words in Galatians to the Galatian believers. Galatian believers, that is dangerous. In fact, these next, these next two verses, uh, it shocked me when I started reading it in different versions. Look at verses 11 and 12. This is how bad... This is how bad this merit mindset, this achievement mindset was for Paul and for us today. Look what he says in starting with verse 11. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer, suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. And then he says this, verse 12, I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. So, you know, I've always read that, cut themselves off. Okay, they should cut themselves off from the community. You know what the word is? They should emasculate themselves. 
what? Paul, I know you're bold, but you're telling these Judaizers to emasculate themselves? To cut off their genitals? Like, what are you talking about? Look, to these, Paul is saying to the Judaizers, if you're going to go, if you're going to be circumcised, just might as well completely, complete the circumcision, for lack of a better way to phrase it. Why would Paul use this kind of language? Because he knew, he knew how dangerous this was. He knew how dangerous this thinking was. Paul said, you're not saved by your, your circumcision and your perfect obedience, and somehow your perfect obedience is going to merit favor with God. He says this in verse 10, Galatian believers, I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will be, you'll have no other mind. Galatian believers, Christians, believers, I've, I have confidence that because of God's grace, you're actually going to walk in the truth and not walk in that false teaching. And then he says this. He says in verses 5 and 6, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And then he says in verse 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails nothing, but, what's that word that starts with F? But faith working through love. So let me write this on the screen. On one hand, you have what we call... um, We'll call it the, did it just freeze on me? Hold on. See, this always happens. I need to get a blackboard, by the way. All right, so number one, we're free from what? Free from the law, okay? We learned that there's this thing called, we'll just call it the MM, okay, the merit mindset. And he's, and Paul's coming on the scene, verse six, and he's saying, look, This merit mindset is no good. It's actually faith. Faith mindset. That's that's the way to live. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails nothing, verse 6, but faith working through love. Paul is saying, believers, I have confidence in you. Did you know that I, your pastor, has confidence in you? I have confidence in you that God, through his spirit, is going to to keep you on the straight and narrow, to keep you on the grace path. Do not, Paul's saying, don't be duped by the merit mindset. Live by faith, not works. Live by faith, not your sacrifice. You know why? Because if we're duped by this merit mindset, all we're going to think about is ourselves, and if I'm thinking about myself constantly, it's going to cause much, what word is that? is going to cause me much anxiety. Let me, let me illustrate it this way. <clears throat> I remember when I became a new believer in 2002, and I had no way to sort through, you know, what laws should I follow. And because I had no filter and I had no way to interpret it, what that was, I thought that I should follow all the rules. And so I immediately thought that the, the speed limit was also the law of God. And so I remember, I don't know if anyone can relate to this, but I remember driving and, and thinking to myself, wow, if I pass 35 miles per hour, uh, Oh man, God's not going to be happy with me, right? So I don't. This is what happened to me, right? I, as I've said, I'm a I'm a recovering perfectionist, right? I'm a recovering Pharisee, and so I'm thinking, all right, got to follow the speed limit, Lord. I'm sorry, I went two miles over, two miles pro, two miles over. I'm sorry. That's how I was in my early Christian experience: accuracy, exactness, merit mindset. And if I'm just, just below 55 to 55 miles per hour at 54, God loves me. Now, some of you can't relate to this, this story. Let me share another example. I was in the country of Bali or the country of Indonesia in the city or the, is it an island of Bali, right? Island of Bali. Uh, we were there in a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful island. And... I noticed that in front of the homes and the businesses, they had their gods, okay? In Bali, unlike most of Indonesia, which is 90% Muslim, Bali has a very Hindu influence. And so the people, okay, the Hindus, they, they, they placed a sacrifice in front of their gods, in front of their home. Why did they do that? To gain the favor of their gods. 
Do you see what religion says? Religion says, I provide the sacrifice in order to be accepted by the gods. In Hinduism, I provide the sacrifice and the gods will accept me. In Islam, there is only one God, Allah. But it's my submission and my sacrifice and my diligence and my commitment that will cause me to be accepted by the gods. In spiritual religion, I provide the sacrifice to be accepted by the gods. But question, is there such thing as a secular religion? You know how religion is defined in the dictionary? A pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance. So you might be here watching online or you might be here considering yourself as a non-spiritual person, but here's, what, here's according to the dictionary, a religion is, uh, to, to have a religion is, means that I have a pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance. You might not believe in God, but perhaps your job is what you worship. Or your spouse is what you worship. Or your children are your supreme importance. Or <clears throat> your degree is supreme importance. Your GPA is supreme importance. So you could be a spiritual religionist, but you can also be a secular religionist. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say that you're in a company and you want to rise in rank. And there's nothing wrong with rising in rank, but you want to rise in rank. In order for you to be accepted by the higher level, what do you have to do? Grit, sacrifice, work hard. I'm not saying, it's not, it's, I'm not saying that uh, it's wrong to work hard. We need to work hard. But could it be that we have idolized our work, hard work, so that we can continue to climb? And what we do is we say, I will work hard, I will sacrifice in order to be accepted by the next level, level up, in order to be accepted by that tribe. You see what religion teaches? Religion teaches I provide the sacrifice in order to be accepted by the gods or to be accepted by my tribe. But you know what the gospel says? Jesus is the sacrifice so I can be accepted by God. I don't think you heard me. Religion says, I provide the sacrifice in order to be accepted by the gods or people. The gospel comes along and says, Jesus is the sacrifice so I can be accepted by God. Amen. It is not what I do and bring to the table that gives me acceptance with God. It is what God does in Jesus Christ to give me acceptance with God. It looks so close, but it's vastly different. And one path causes anxiety. And the second path, you know what it, what it gives you? It gives you assurance so I'm not constantly thinking have I kept the speed limit perfectly have I kept the laws perfectly yes there's a place for that but remember receiving faith is receiving Christ my sacrifice doesn't merit favor with God only Christ's sacrifice merits favor with God so this is what Paul means by being free from the law <laughs> I am free from the law as a way to merit God's favor. Is that clear or no? All right, any more explanation or is that pretty clear? All right, last, last um, point. So, so number one, we are free, what is it again? From the law, okay. Good students, you remember. Okay, number two, I am free, see if you can read my handwriting. I am free for the law. Two gospel realities. Number one, I am free from the law, but I'm also free for the law. It's simultaneous. Where is that in the text? Verse 13. Here we go. You guys ready? Verse 13, Paul speaking, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Freedom. That's another word for freedom. You have been called for freedom. And then he says, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Question, am I free to do whatever I want according to this text? No. Paul's saying, we are free. We're free to do whatever we want. But he says, verse 13, you have been called to liberty, only do not use your liberty or your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. In other words, I am, not, I am free, but I am not free to sin. Okay? Modern culture, modern culture says that freedom is freedom to do anything that you want. Okay, look at look at look social media. Look, go on YouTube. Look at all the TV channels. We're free. We're liberated from these oppressive traditional hierarchies and structures. We don't need church and we don't need religion and we don't need institutions to tell us what to do. We are now free beings. But the reality is, 
total freedom doesn't work. Two examples. Number one, my daughter, she's at Hinsdale Adventist Academy, pre-K. There's, it, she, her and her friends enjoy playing in the sandbox and they enjoy playing in the playground. Uh, but I noticed that they're, they're limited in where they can run. You know why? Because they have a thing that's made of iron. I think it's made of iron. It's black. It's called a fence. And if it wasn't for that fence, they would be a, the kids would be a danger of running past, playing, playing tag, freeze tag, running past onto the road and getting hit by a car. Complete freedom doesn't work. You need boundaries. Let me give you another example. Let's talk about marriage. A marriage that does not have boundaries, that's not true freedom. It's not. Because if I'm not, if there's no, if there's no boundaries and I'm crossing that line, do you think that my, the other party's happy? So complete freedom doesn't work. We need boundaries to restrict us from, from destroying ourselves, right? Or to, to keep us from trying, destroying ourselves. So then, Paul, what is the solution? Verse 13, here we go. Here we go. For only for you, brethren, have been called to liberty, to freedom. Only do not use your liberty or freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through, what's that L word? But through love, serve one another. Yes, sir. I love it. Thank you, Paul. This is what he means. Being free for the law means, oh, you guys know what I wrote there, right? Being free for the law means that I am Free to, ooh, I am free to love. Can you see it? Yes, it's on the screen. I am free to love. All right, I asked you to put your thinking caps on. Keep it on. I promise you I'm, I'm going to try to land this plane and give you some illustrations to make sense of this, okay? I am free from the law as a way to merit my salvation, God has provided the sacrifice, right? He's provided Christ so that I can be accepted by him. But, see, when Jesus came on this planet, check this out, he saved me, right? So we'll call that redemption. That's an R. When Jesus came, he redeemed me. But before I, he even redeemed me and saved me from sin, what did he do at the beginning of time? He designed me. So what does this mean? That because of God's great love, he paid a price in my design, price number one, whatever that cost, it was really expensive, and then he paid a really expensive price for the second price, or the second cost, which was redemption. He paid with his life. So because God, because God designed me, and because God redeemed me, I am doubly obligated to love God in return. Does that make sense? You still don't get it. Let me use this example. Now, my, this, this illustration does not compare to what, what God has done for us in Christ. But let me use this illustration. Catherine risked her, risked her, uh, her life three times for me. Number one, I said, Catherine, will you be my girlfriend? She said, yes. Number two, I got on my knees in October 2012 after I ran, the, I ran the Chicago Marathon. And I said, Catherine, will you marry me? What'd she say? Yes. All right? Risk number two. <laughs> Cost number two. And then on July 7, 2013, after she read her vows and when the pastor asked Catherine, will you fulfill your vow, promise to fulfill your vows and, and, and commit your life forever to this man? Guess what she said? She said yes, three times. So I am triply obligated to love her in return for all the love that she gives me. In fact, let me illustrate it this way. Her, her vow, okay, it was, it was a very nice vow. I don't remember all the details, but whatever her vow said, right, whatever her vow said, it did not include uh, getting water for her at 1130 at night. It was not listed on the vow. But because I am triply obligated, because she has loved me so much, I am obligated not because I have to, but because I want to, to get water at 11.30 and even, God forbid, 2 o'clock in the morning. Because not only do I want to, you know, ask, oh, what is the minimum that I can actually fulfill my vow for my wife? 
No, because, because she's triply loved me, I exceed whatever that vow is, and I go the extra 10 miles because she loves me despite all the mistakes and the, the, the foibles that I have. Hallelujah. This is what it means to be free to love. This is what it means to be free to love. That I can actually love God, not his law, but love the lawgiver. And I can love the lawgiver. Why? Not because I, I should like try harder. No, but because, because Christ has designed me, paid a price here, and then he has redeemed me. He paid the infinite price. And because he paid an infinite price, I am infinitely obligated to respond in love to him and to follow him and to follow his law because the law is the expression of his nature and his character. Does that make sense? So that's how God frees me to love. And I will say this. Many people and many here think, ah, those commandments, that's old school. Forget that. I don't need the commandments. That's old school. That's for the older folk, right? You know why many of us don't like the commandments of God? Because we don't like the command. We don't know the commandment giver. The reason I love to follow the vows in my marriage is because I'm in love with the vow giver, Catherine. And when you fall in love and you have a, a, a real relationship with the one who gave his life for you, and you know how much he gave for you, you're not going to say, oh, man, I just can't stand these commandments. You're going to say, okay, God, what are your laws? And how can I go to the nth degree because you went to the, not nth, the zith, is that even a word? It's the zith degree, the infinite degree for me. I am obligated because you gave your life. You give infinity for me. Thank you, Jesus. So gospel freedom reality number one. I am free from the law. Gospel reality number two, I am free for the law, which causes me to be free to love. But pastor, last but not least, pastor, what about the social realities? What about loving my neighbor? I mean, we're talking about Mother's Day. What about the social realities? Paul has something to say about social realities and loving each other as a church community, as Republicans and Democrats, as uh, conservatives and progressives, as traditionalists and free, free birds, can do whatever I want. You know what Paul says here? Check this out. Galatians chapter 5, 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love who? Your neighbor as yourself. Verse 15. But if you bite... If you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I, for some reason, the idea of two pit bulls just devouring and biting each other came to my mind. <laughs> he says, if you bite and devour one another like pit bulls, believers, beware lest you be consumed by one another. And then I read verse 6, which will be our last verse, that I had never seen before. Like I had never seen that, you know, he, he asked that the believers, that the Judaizers be emasculated. I had never seen this paradigm before in verse 6. Check this out. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails nothing but faith working through love. Let me diagram this and then we're done. Oh, man, this, is, this is amazing, okay? I hope you, I, you get excited as, as, as excited as I am. Check this out. So he says that, okay, let's just draw this line here, okay? He says that Circumcision nor uncircumcision avails nothing. Okay? But what, then what does he say? What's the pinnacle? He says, but, but faith in who? Jesus Christ is everything. Do you know why we, we're like pit bulls sometimes and bite each other? This is why. Because, you know, these are the, these are the strict people over here and we're free. And you know why we bite each other? The reason why we, the free people bite at the strict people is because they, start, they, they identify themselves as the uncircumcised. In other words, their identity is rooted in the fact that they are not like the other party. All right, I'm going to hide and you, I'm going to come back and act surprised. <laughs> Verse 
the free people, their identity is, I'm so glad I'm not like them. <laughs> Paul's saying, look, circumcision, circumcision doesn't mean anything. But don't boast, Galatian believers, in your uncircumcision. Don't boast in what you are not. Oh, guys, this, this applies in so many levels. Talk about the abortion issue in our politics today. Man, those pro-lifers, who, thank God, I'm not like them, right? And over here, no, no, this is, that's, those are the pro-choicers, right? Those pro-choicers, right? And over here, ooh, those strict pro-lifers, how dare they? And their identity is wrapped up in who I'm not. Thank God I'm not like him or her, and thank God I'm not like them. It happens in the church. Ah, oh, man, those progressives, too free, too free. Thank God I'm not like them. Thank God that we are strict and we hold to the values no matter what. And then over here, man, they're old school. Can't, don't they just get it? They're from a different, different generation. Thank God I'm not like them. And friends, I will say this. The more I identify with what I am not, the more I'm going to devour and bite people. What about families? What about, what, how, about, how about our homes? Man, thank God I'm not like that free uncle over there. Whew. Man, thank God I'm not like my parents. Thank God. Friends, the more I identify with what I am not, the more I'm going to divide, to bite and devour people. <laughs> That's why Paul says, your strictness and your liberalness or your freedom, that's not your main identity. Your main identity is faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, it's not what I do. It's not what I don't do. It's what Jesus does for me. And the more I associate what with Christ does for me, the more I can actually love people who are different from me. Does that make sense? My identity is not what I don't do or what I do. or not. It's not saying I'm not like them, thank God, or I'm not like them, thank God. My identity is I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and what he does for me. And you know what he does? He actually creates this thing called love, which comes by faith so that I can actually love people who think different from, differently from me. Now, friends, I don't want to be, I don't want to act like this is easy because there are some times in relationships where the values are so off and so different that there needs to be a time where there's a separation. I, I know this is, it's a real, it's a reality because it's too, it hurts too much because the abuse hurts too much. But I will say this, that the more that I can identify myself, not in not being like that person or that person, but the more that I can identify with what Jesus does for me, that I'm a child of God, the easier it will be, not saying it's easy, the easier it will be for me to forgive. And the, I'm not saying it's easy, but the faster it will be for me to heal from the trauma. And as I believe by faith in Christ, <laughs> last word and I'm done. As I believe in, if I believe in, you know what he says in verse six here? He says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails nothing, but faith working through love. Question, what's primary in the text? Loving people or having faith? He says, faith working through love. In other words, what's faith is primary. And I'm like, Lord, didn't you say that love is primary? No, 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 no. God tells us that faith is primary because it's impossible, it's impossible for me to love people that I don't like. But when I believe in Christ and what he has done for me, he gives me, he unlocks, he unlocks the capacity for me to love even my enemies. That's why the starting point is not love because within my own heart, I cannot love other people, even my enemies and even those who hurt me. 
But when I have faith in the one who loved me and died for me, even when I rejected him and I sinned against him, I say, whoa, what amazing love. And as I believe in that and I'm exposed to that, he changes my heart and then he gives me the capacity to love my friends and to love my enemies. And friends, I do want to say this. Faith. Faith. We are free from the law as a way to earn our salvation. But we are also free for the law. We are free to love the lawgiver at the same time. At the same time. And how do we enter this experience? Paul says this in verse 6. Faith working through love. By believing and receiving and enjoying that salvation. And there's a young girl by the name of Nela who experienced this in her heart. And we're going to witness a beautiful baptism here of someone who said, I don't want to live for myself. I want to live for Jesus. Not because I'm perfect, but because he's perfect. And I have faith and believe in him, which helps me to love God and to help me to love others. So friends, we're going to witness this. We're going to, I guess, move a few things here. All right. I'm going to witness a baptism. And as they're coming into the water here, and we're putting up the projector and, and splitting the Red Sea here, or the, the curtain, let's be blessed by this. And I, want, I would like to ask that the family of Nela, you can stay where you're seated. You, can, you feel free to stand at this moment, okay? Let's stand at this moment. And let us, let's enjoy watching this baptism. Amen, amen. We, we rejoice today in the freedom that Jesus has provided for us. Can we say amen, church? Amen. amen. Nayla has been experiencing and growing in that knowledge of the freedom that Jesus has provided for her. And this is such a special moment for us as a family to be able to, to share and to be able to see her come to this decision. We've been talking about this and she's been asking me about it ever since last summer at summer camp. As we see different campers and staff give their lives to Jesus, she's been saying, Dad, I wanna give my life to Jesus. I wanna, I wanna get baptized and you know, last week when we had our Pathfinder Camporee, our, our guest speaker made an appeal on Sabbath. And, and as a father, it was exciting to be able to, I'm going to try to get through this. <laughs> it was exciting to be able to see her, you know, make, make that decision again. And, uh, and as we even... As Pastor Nestor has been sharing uh, from the book of Galatians, you know, there's a verse that we talked about that Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Remember that verse? Where he says that the life he lives uh, is the life of Christ living in him. And he lives this life by faith, trusting in Jesus and what he has provided for him and what he has already done for him. And he says that he lives this life because of the one who loved him and gave himself for him. <clears throat> We're going to do this. We're going to do this. She's like totally fine. <laughs> I wanted to say it's the splashing of the water or something, but we haven't even gone in. But... Um, but Nayla, as, as mom is here and as your sister and your brother, you know, we love you with all of our heart. But Jesus loves you so much more. And, and it's, it's uh, my greatest joy. Man! <laughs> <laughs> to be able to share this moment together, right? So let's, let's pray together. And we're going we're gonna to read actually Nayla's favorite Bible passage 
from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Amen. Nayla, this, this same Jesus who loves you and gave himself for you also has a plan for your life. We're seeing that plan develop, and we're excited to see how that plan is going to continue to, to show itself in your life. Mom and dad, the whole family, right? You see grandma, aunts, and uncles, and your cousins, they're all here, and they're so excited for you. And we see all of our church family here. We have friends as well. Everybody here is excited for this decision that you've made in telling the entire universe that Jesus is your best friend, that he is your savior, and that you want to live your life for him, trusting in him. So as your dad is the minister of the gospel, the minister in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I'm excited to be able to share this moment with you. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness. Father God, we, we begin to understand just how great your sacrifice was on our behalf. And Father God, we, we rejoice for the freedom that your life has provided. And Father, we know that as you resurrected from the tomb, that same power that rose you from the dead is the same power that is alive and in us today. And so, Father God, we are thankful for Nayla's decision to be able to publicly express what you've been already doing in her heart and to be able to share with the world that she has decided to be joined with you. And so, as her father, as a minister of the gospel, it's my honor and privilege to be able to baptize her in the name of her father who is in heaven, the son Jesus Christ who died for her, and the Holy Spirit that will guide her every day of her life. Amen. Buried with Jesus, living for Jesus. Amen. so beautiful. Thank you, Campos family. So touching. Our praise team is going to come up. I mean, what else can I say? But when Jesus Christ's love touches your heart and frees you from trying to earn his love and frees you to love him in return because of his great love for you, this is what happens. You believe in Christ and you're saved and he leads you to baptism. And so, I'm not going to make this a few long. Our praise team is going to come up. Feel free to line up. I'm, I will say this. If, if you uh, want to make a decision, you've never made a decision to be baptized before. Um, I'm going to come here, sing my heart out. I'm going to sing my heart out in the front pew as this, the praise team closes with this song. I'm going to ask that you come next to me and join me in the front pew as we face and sing the song. But maybe you've never been baptized before or you're thinking about it and you want to start that journey. Or maybe you've, you've been severed from Christ. You've, been, you've left him and, and you're wanting to come back and be re I, I've been baptized before, but I want to get rebaptized. If God's speaking to your heart to be baptized or rebaptized and to start that journey, I'll be singing up, singing up front here with everyone else. And I invite you to come stand next to me as we sing this closing song. You want to be baptized, rebaptized, you're thinking about it? Come join me as we sing. So I'll be down here. Everyone, let's rise and sing together. And if you're feeling impressed, come join me. And uh, let's sing this closing song. Let's worship one last time.
are finished. If so, Arlene, would you mind grabbing the Pastor Mike and, and Nela? I'd love to have a special prayer. I do want to say this. If you are thinking about getting baptized or rebaptized or starting a relationship with Christ, talk to me. Talk to Pastor Rodney. Talk to your pastors. We want to begin. We want to come alongside you in your journey with Christ. And talk to us. We're here for you. Are they finished? Nela, come on up. Come on up. The baptizer too, baptizer too, Papa, Papa, Papa. <laughs> so the Campos family, Nela is over, they're already part of our church family, but let's make it official. Can I see a raise of hands who, who say, welcome to our church family, Nela, officially. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Nela, we love you. We love you, Campos family. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for what you have done in Christ, that because of your great sacrifice, I don't have to identify with what I don't do, I don't have to identify with what I do, but I identify with what Christ continues to do for me and what he has done for me. And so, Lord, thank you for freeing me from my slavery to my own law-keeping, but also thank you for freeing me to love you in return because of your great sacrifice. Bless us, Lord, and thank you for Nela and her decision. May you bless her. Bless the Campos family. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, there is a gift, a special gift for Nela for her baptism. And Nela, I want to invite you to stand with us in the back as people greet you. So church family, please greet Nela uh, and congratulate her for her baptism. And join us for potluck to celebrate. Oh, and there are also extra roses for mom. So... In case you didn't get one or you want to give one to someone, feel free. Okay, come on. Let's go. Everything, all I am and all I have to bring.
Turning. 